Stanford University. Well, I've been looking forward to this uh, for a while. We've put together this four-part uh, series, and I was asked uh, to describe the technology. And uh, I had to create a whole new talk from uh, any that I've given before because so much has happened uh, just uh, this year. And uh, uh, the talk will probably be obsolete in another couple of months because uh, uh, the technology is moving uh, forward so fast uh, now. Uh, so let me go ahead and get started because there's a, a lot to say. And uh, I, I apologize that I'm going to go through these slides so fast, um, but they are posted on my website. Uh, and I've put a lot of references in so you can um, uh, uh, find out uh, more about all of these topics. So what's the challenge that many of us here are uh, uh, trying uh, to address? Uh, with solar cells, we want to provide the world uh, with something like 10 terawatts of uh, power uh, by the year 2030. If we could do that, uh, we could make a really uh, large step towards uh, preventing uh, global climate change. And to do that, the industry needs to grow at about 35% uh, per year, um, which it has been doing. In fact, uh, in, in recent years, there have been years of 50% growth and 80% uh, growth. Uh, so the industry uh, definitely has been growing at that level. But it's one thing to do when you're a small industry uh, and another thing to do when you're a large industry, uh, which the, the solar cell industry is becoming. Uh, we have to make sure that we don't run out of essential materials, and there's concern that that's going to start to happen uh, with the tellurium that is needed for cadmium telluride cells and the indium that is needed for copper indium gallium uh, selenide. Another factor you hear less about, uh, you'd really like it if you could be profitable enough to make enough money in two years to double your capacity, uh, because uh, at, at that growth rate, you're, uh, you're, you're doubling in just a tiny bit more than uh, two years. And at some point, you just can't continue to do this with investment. Um, you have to be making profits and using the profits uh, to sustain the growth. And so a key factor there is uh, your factories need to be cheap. Um, and, and that translates to the equipment needs to have very high throughput so that um, a relatively inexpensive tool uh, can produce a lot of uh, solar cells. And then another interesting to think, thing to think about, if your energy payback time is longer than two years, then what's happening is you're, you're doubling your uh, production capacity over a two-year period, but you're using all of the energy that was produced by all the cells you'd already made uh, just to provide the energy to build the new uh, factories. So you haven't provided the world with any new power until you stop the ramp up. Um, and then when you stop the ramp up, you have all the cells out there. But if your energy payback is shorter than that, then you're reducing carbon emissions during the ramp up. Uh, and, and, and that would clearly be desirable. And the good news is uh, First Solar has an energy payback time of um, uh, just 8 tenths of a year. So uh, some of the uh, technologies are, are already able uh, to do that. Uh, I, I really don't want to talk too much about economics uh, today, but I want to remind you of some of the highlights uh, from uh, Annie Haselhurst's uh, lecture uh, two, two weeks ago. I particularly like this plot because it shows how the cost that you need to get grid parity varies. It depends on where you are, because the more expensive the electricity is, the easier it is to get grid parity, and the more sunshine uh, you have at a location, the, the easier it is. Uh, and so uh, in Italy, uh, these, are, these are equal uh, price contours. So in Italy, uh, you, you only need to get about $6 a watt to compete with the grid, and, and we're there. So we have grid parity in Italy. And then California is one of the first uh, places uh, that you um, uh, hit. And so we're, we're, we're nearing that point, um, even without uh, subsidies, of, of being uh, competitive in uh, California. Let me just say a little bit um, about the, the physics of how uh, most solar cells work. They don't all work this way, but the, the conventional ones uh, certainly do. Uh, maybe at the end of the lecture, I'll be talking about some that, that work differently. There's usually a, a PN junction. Uh, uh, there's P-type semiconductor, meaning there are a lot of holes in it. 
and n-type, meaning there are a lot of electrons. And if you uh, brought those two materials together, uh, you'd have an excess of electrons over here, and they would start to diffuse over uh, to where there are fewer electrons, and, and holes would diffuse over this way. But as you move the negative charge over to this side and positive charge to the other, you'll, you'll build an electric field. And when the drift current due to that field cancels out the uh, diffusion current, uh, then you've uh, attained equilibrium. And because of that uh, charge there, you have a tilt uh, in the energy bands, or in other words, there is an electric field. And that electric field uh, enables uh, the splitting of charge. If a light is absorbed, uh, the field will send electrons over to the right, and it will send holes over uh, to the left. Now, it doesn't just work in the junction. If light is absorbed outside the junction, the carriers can diffuse. There's no electric field over there, but they can diffuse to the junction and then be uh, pulled away. So in a material like silicon that doesn't absorb very well, it's not possible to absorb all the light uh, in this um, uh, so-called depletion region. Uh, the carriers are typically formed well away, uh, easily 50 microns away in some cases, and they uh, diffuse there. And so you end up needing fairly high material quality. If you have low material quality, uh, the, uh, the, the carriers will tend to recombine, either because the defects promote that or because they trap the carriers and slow them down and keep them from getting uh, uh, to where they can be uh, pulled away. And of course, in this whole thing, there's going to be this trade-off where, uh, especially in the lab, we can make very high-quality materials, and, and you know, we can make a world-record silicon cell with 24% efficiency. Uh, but the steps that we use to make such a high-quality device are expensive, and, and so trade-offs uh, end up having uh, to be made. Now I want to talk just a little bit about the efficiency limit uh, we have a, a, a trade-off in that if the uh, photons have less energy than the band gap, they can't be absorbed. Uh, so we want a, a low band gap to absorb a lot of light and get a high current. On the other hand, when carriers are excited up into the bands, they rapidly relax to the band edge and we lose all of that energy. The voltage can't possibly be greater uh, than the uh, band gap energy divided by the charge of an electron. Uh, so as we go to low band gap, uh, we have high current and low voltage, and, and uh, at high band gap, we have low current. And uh, uh, it's a simple math problem to find out that the optimal band gap is about 1.4 electron volts, and you can do about 31% uh, percent efficiency, and that's called the shockley uh, quiser limit. But there are ways to beat the shockley quiser limit. That was for one junction with one semiconductor. Uh, you can use multiple uh, junctions, and here the idea is to have uh, uh, several cells in series with each other, and uh, the light will first go through the high band gap material, which will harvest the high energy photons and generate a high voltage, and then we have a medium band gap and a low band gap material. And think of this like three batteries in series. The current will be the same. Uh, it'll be actually the one, uh, it'll be limited by the one that has the lowest current, but the voltages will add. And so we can extract more power. And just this year, uh, uh, Spectra Watt, uh, or I'm sorry, Spectra Lab uh, uh, set the, a new world record of 41.6% uh, uh, efficiency uh, for one of these uh, triple junction uh, solar cells. So that's really a, a remarkable uh, efficiency. This is uh, kind of a nice plot that shows you how all of the technologies have evolved, and uh, it'll be uh, on my website so you can uh, study it. Uh, you see the, the, the champion up here, the multi-junction cells, and you can see how long it took for silicon uh, to get up to uh, basically about 25% right now. You can see some of the newer technologies like organic solar uh, rapidly uh, coming up. And, and maybe get some idea from the past of how long it will take. Of course, you have to keep in mind that this development here was done during a period uh, when hardly anyone cared about solar. Um, only a few real diehards uh, pushed uh, uh, ahead. Uh, funding was very low, and, and you know, the people who did this uh, didn't have the resources uh, that we're fortunate uh, to have now. So as I compare all of these technologies, 
uh, and everyone's going to want to know which technology is the best. I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to give you the answer, or I'm, I, I don't have an answer. Uh, and I, I think the answer does depend on the specific application. Uh, the, and and you, you, you look at the first one. Obviously, uh, the efficiency um, is, is important. And, and uh, you know, it affects the, the balance of systems costs. And uh, mostly here, I'm going to talk about the module itself. But let's just say you have 20% modules and 10% modules. Um, then you're going to need twice as many of the 10% modules. Um, and so the installation costs are uh, going to be um, higher. However, I think a lot of people make a mistake to say that they're going to be twice as high. Imagine um, that you want to have three kilowatts installed on your uh, roof, and we're comparing whether we're going to do this with 20% modules or 10% modules. Most of the cost is getting the permit, getting someone to come out and examine your house and figure out how to put this thing up, what angle it should be, getting someone to come out there. If you really think about it, the additional time to slap a few more panels on your roof um, is hardly anything at all. It's not going to cost much. Yeah, there's going to be more glass, and there's going to be a little bit more wiring, um, but I don't think it's going to scale quite the way um, people who do research on high-efficiency solar cells uh, say it's going to scale. On the other hand, the situation changes if you're doing a solar farm or if you're covering the roof of, say, Walmart, because you didn't specify how many watts. You said cover the roof. And if you cover the roof with 20% uh, cells instead of 10% cells, you're going to get twice as much power. And, uh, and when you express the cost in dollars per watt, it's, it's going to come down. And so um, how much you care about um, high efficiency might depend on where you're installing the solar cells. Obviously, we want a, a low cost. Uh, the throughput of the equipment comes in and, and how rapidly we can scale up a technology. Um, like I was uh, uh, saying at the beginning, uh, some of these technologies that, that are doing really, really well now uh, may slow down dramatically because we're going to start to run out of certain elements. Cadmium telluride has cadmium in it, which is um, uh, toxic. We're going to see the multi-junction cells. They need direct light. They won't work well at all on a cloudy day, but other technologies will. So the technology you would put out in the desert might not be the technology that you would put in Germany or uh, Seattle. And finally, aesthetics, they don't mean anything on top of Walmart, but if you're going to put it on top of your roof, um, <coughs> aesthetics could be very uh, important. <coughs> So let's look at uh, one of the first technologies, multi-crystalline uh, silicon. Uh, this is uh, based on wafers. You, you grow these enormous crystals of silicon and uh, saw it and, and, and polish it. And uh, uh, this is, is doing quite well. It's, it's the industry leader. Uh, you can now buy modules at uh, 15 to 18% efficiency. Uh, I think they cost about $500 a meter squared. And so uh, they're selling for about $3 a watt. Uh, the companies that are doing the best, like SunTech, um, can do it at $1.50 a watt, so they can sell at $3 a watt, which means they're, they're making uh, pretty nice uh, profits right now. So that's the, the module cost. The inverter that converts DC to AC electricity uh, be something like $0.50 cents a watt. And then if you um, installed this on a pre-existing home, uh, that might be about $4 uh, a watt. So total, you might get something like $7.50 uh, a watt. And if that lasts for 30 years, and if you take out a loan with 6% interest, uh, you'll calculate over the lifetime, you'll see average costs of somewhere like uh, 28 um, uh, cents per uh, kilowatt hour. And that's with, with no subsidies. And the average grid electricity in California is about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. But uh, the peak rates in California are 29 cents per kilowatt hour, and the sun gives you power uh, when we need it most, when the peak rates are in effect. And so it really already makes a lot of sense uh, for, uh, uh, for us to use uh, solar in, in California. And these rates get even better when you can uh, deduct the um, taxes you have to pay on the interest. Uh, and then when you factor in the subsidies, you know, this comes way down. And we saw last week, uh, Lyndon Reeve from Solar City showed us 
um, how it makes a lot of economic sense with the subsidies. And I have to compliment him on a phenomenal job of figuring out how to get uh, as many tax write-offs um, as, as, uh, as possible. That was really extraordinary way of figuring out how to do that. <coughs> The point I want to make on this slide is um, it's a lot cheaper to install cells in commercial um, and, and utility settings. And so here, these are some prices. They're, they're, they're getting a little, little bit old. I hear much lower numbers now. But you might see something like $9 a watt for residential dropping to $670 uh, on top of a commercial building, dropping down to about $5 a watt. Uh, if you're doing a, a, a big farm of uh, solar cells. and Because a lot of people say, well, you know, it, your module prices are now, by the end of the talk, you'll see they're below a dollar per watt. And, um, you know, getting another dime or two out of that might not seem that important uh, when the installation costs are this high. But those costs are coming down as well. I hope to show you some ways um, of how those costs are going to come down. And uh, one of the ways is, is simply by um, doing the very large uh, installations. So uh, I'm not going to be able to cover all the technologies, but um, I'll cover some of the, some of the uh, more interesting ones. Uh, this is a technology that was invented right here at uh, Stanford. This is the sun power uh, design um, invented by Dick Swanson. What's really cool and unique about it is that there's no electrode on the top. Uh, both the um, P-type and N-type uh, uh, heavily doped parts are on the back, and the electrodes are all on the back. This is very, very high quality silicon. Uh, light comes in and gets absorbed, and the carriers are able to diffuse all the way down uh, to where the electric field can send them uh, to the appropriate uh, electrode. And so one thing that's nice with no metal on top, um, there's uh, nothing blocking the light, so there are no shadow uh, losses. Um, and you can uh, have very thick uh, metal electrodes, uh, which cuts down on the series resistance. This was originally designed for concentration, where you can have very high currents. And uh, because of the thick metal, um, you, you uh, don't have this uh, high series resistance losses. But a lot of times, um, there are unanticipated uh, benefits. And the real reason people like it is it looks good. Uh, there's just no metal um, on top, and you know this is a conventional uh, uh, multi-junction. I'm sorry, um, uh, multi-crystalline silicon cell, and this is a sun power cell, and a lot of people um, uh, strongly prefer to have that on their roof uh, instead of uh, this one. But the other great thing, um, uh, these cells, uh, sun power can um, uh, sell them at 21% efficiency, so uh, they've got a very um, uh, uh, high efficiency compared to most of the other technologies uh, that are out there. And so also for applications where uh, people really want the high efficiency, they usually go with uh, sun power. You pay about an extra dollar per watt for that for the modules, uh, but then you know, you, it's easier to install them uh, because the uh, installation area is lower. Okay, now let me switch over to thin films. So here the idea is that instead of the whole structure being uh, crystalline silicon, uh, we're going to have a cheap substrate, glass or uh, a metal foil, maybe even plastic, and we're going to deposit just a small amount of um, semiconductor. Uh, so we'll use less semiconductor, um, and then this could be flexible, um, and so perhaps we incorporate it directly into roofing material uh, that can be installed at um, low cost. And, um, if, the, if the module packaging is also thin and lightweight, the whole thing is lightweight and the shipping costs really uh, come down. So the first technology uh, I'm going to go through here is uh, cadmium telluride. Uh, most of the uh, light is absorbed uh, in the uh, cadmium telluride, which is P-type. There's just a very thin layer of um, uh, cadmium sulfide that acts as the uh, N-type uh, semiconductor. Uh, and there are a lot of great things about this technology. The uh, band gap um, is nearly perfect, um, about 1.45 uh, uh, electron volts. Uh, the world record efficiency is 16.5%. Uh, um, not quite as good as silicon, but very respectable. Um, uh, companies uh, are, are able to uh, sell modules 
uh, that have an 11% uh, efficiency. It's worth talking about why modules are always less than the world record. Um, part of that is that um, as, as cells and modules get larger, you have series resistance uh, losses carrying the current across the structure. Um, part of it, is, as any graduate student uh, knows, you can, um, you, know, you can make 100 cells, pick the best one, ignore all the rest, and uh, uh, focus everything on that one. Um, and part of it is, uh, let me go ahead a couple of slides. Uh, the, it, if the cadmium sulfide absorbs light, uh, you almost never collect those uh, carriers. And here you see the quantum efficiency versus wavelength, and it's much higher when the cadmium sulfide is extremely thin. But when you uh, try to manufacture with a layer that thin, you tend to have the occasional pinhole and if the electrode goes through the pinhole, that shorts out the solar cell, uh, and it doesn't work. Um, so in, if you're going for the world record, you just toss that one aside and, and look until you get a good one. Uh, but if you're making big modules, um, you can't afford to have defects like that. So you need to go with a thicker um, layer uh, to boost your, uh, your yields. Uh, this is a, a stable technology. And uh, what's really special about cadmium uh, telluride is that when you evaporate it, the two elements come off in the right ratio. Um, a lot of times if you heat a compound, one element will come off faster than the other one. So you can just put cadmium telluride down, evaporate it at extremely um, high rates uh, with the substrate um, almost right up against the source. You lose very little material um, onto the uh, reaction chamber and have enormous uh, throughput. Uh, and so this has enabled uh, First Solar to be one of the huge uh, success stories of the industry. 2005, they were at um, 25 uh, megawatts. They quadrupled in 2006. They tripled in 2007, more than doubled um, in 2008. Continued at a very good clip uh, uh, to go over um, a, a, a gigawatt in 2009. Not that long ago, the whole world um, was not producing a gigawatt of um, uh, solar cells in, in one year. And now uh, one thin film company uh, is, is able to do that. You look at the cost, uh, they went from $1.40 a watt to $1.23 to $1.08. I think the latest number I've heard is that they're at 93 cents a watt uh, for their modules um, in 2009. So, they are really uh, doing extraordinarily well. But uh, there are two problems uh, that a lot of people like to bring up. The first one is that cadmium is um, toxic. Uh, and First Solar says that this is manageable, that they can handle it safely in the factory. It's not um, a hazard. If there's a fire, the, the glass in the module will um, uh, uh, contain the cadmium. And they have a recycling program. When you buy their modules, uh, some of the uh, money you give them goes into a fund, uh, which is set aside uh, to pay for the recycling uh, when, uh, when you're done with the uh, product. Uh, so uh, it appears to be manageable, but I'm not an expert on the subject. John Benner next week is one of the leading authorities on that subject, and, and uh, perhaps he'll talk about it next week. Then the next big question, is there enough uh, tellurium? And I have to say, it really annoys me that everyone gives a very firm yes or a very firm no. Um, things are more complicated uh, than that. And I'll do my best uh, to tell you what I know about the subject. Um, you can do straightforward calculations of how much, um, uh, uh, how much tellurium you need to make two micron thick cells. You just need to know the density, the mass fraction of the tellurium. Uh, and, and you get 5.7 grams per meter squared. And then we know that the sun gives us a kilowatt per meter squared, and if we assume 10% efficient cells, we get about 16 watts of power uh, for every um, gram of tellurium we use. You can look uh, at the, the database that the United States Geological Survey has, and uh, uh, they'll uh, tell you uh, what the world reserve of tellurium is and it's 47,000 tons. If you combine that with the number on the previous page, you calculate that under peak uh, solar conditions, if we used 
all of the tellurium, every single bit of it, um, we could produce about 0.68 terawatts. Or averaged throughout the day, that would be about um, 0.14 terawatts. And when we say the world needs 30 terawatts of power in 2030, we mean averaged um, throughout the day. Um, so we really want that average number to be something like 5 or 10 uh, uh, terawatts. So first of all, one way of looking at it, um, the industry can do quite well. That, that, that is not a negligible amount of power, and, and, and plenty of money can be made um, uh, producing the cells to make that much power. Uh, but of course, we would like to do even, even better than that. Now, one of the things that makes this story complicated is you, you, have, to, you have to look at the definition of, the, of what they mean by reserve. It doesn't mean that's how much tellurium we have on the planet. It's, that's, how much we have, that's how much we know about that could be economically recovered. So one thing is that number would change instantly if the price of tellurium went up, because now you would decide um, that there are some sources that you already knew about that are economically uh, favorable. Uh, so uh, that number changed, just like the, the oil reserve changes when the price of oil doubles. So, you know, when it gets to $200 a barrel, I think $150 a barrel, the tar sands up in Canada um, become economical. So that number uh, can change around. And then uh, Dave Eaglesham, the, the, the vice president of research from First Solar, when, uh, when I reminded him of all of these numbers uh, in front of a couple hundred people this spring, uh, he made the point that um, we have approximately a 30-year reserve of every element. And when we get a 30-year reserve, we stop looking. We figure that's, that's, that's good enough. There's no uh, crisis if we have a 30-year uh, reserve. So his opinion and, and, and many people's opinion is that we will find more. But a lot of times they describe it like we'll just go and one day we'll dig in and then there it'll be. It'll just be this huge deposit. Well, again, I'm not a geologist, but um, uh, there aren't really any, uh, any known sources of um, wonderful uh, uh, tellurium ores. It's usually a byproduct of copper uh, mining, and it's, it's found at very low concentrations. And, and one of the problems is there's no such thing as a tellurium mine. You mine copper, and you just collect the tellurium that's a byproduct. So, um, and, and only a tiny, tiny fraction of the profits from the mine come from tellurium. The profits come from the copper. And so you can't really double production of the mining facility uh, to get more uh, tellurium. You can only do that if you had a use um, for the uh, copper. But what will happen, see a lot of the copper plants don't have a facility for, mine, for uh, extracting the tellurium. They're just letting it go. So that's changing really fast. Um, um, I'm sure all the copper facilities will have the equipment to get the tellurium. And right now, that equipment is not very efficient. So they'll start to improve the efficiency um, of that equipment. And then you know, a year or two ago, they predicted that uh, we would go out and find tellurium. And that is what's happening. We're finding places where it is more concentrated. And just in the last month, a really excellent paper came out um, by Martin Green uh, that describes um, the economics of mining, and specifically uh, for tellurium and um, indium. Uh, and so I would encourage you to, to, uh, to, to go there to learn more about this uh, subject. Uh, and basically, uh, skipping ahead uh, with SIGs, the numbers are almost exactly the same with indium, uh, that you can get about 0.2 uh, terawatts. And so potentially, both of these technologies could be really held back. Um, and it's very possible that people will find other inorganic uh, semiconductors. And um, this is um, a, a, a table that uh, Stacy Bent uh, gave me that shows the availability of a bunch of the um, elements, and you see how low it is for indium and uh, tellurium. Uh, there are semiconductors that could work based on abundant elements, and these four, copper, zinc, tin, sulfide, um, is an example. Uh, so, and people have already uh, made solar cells with it. It's at about 6.7% uh, uh, efficiency. And I think it's very uh, plausible uh, that with some development, 
um, those numbers will come up to 20% like they are uh, with uh, SIGs. Uh, and so Stacy Bent and, and Bruce Clemens are uh, uh, starting to do research here at Stanford uh, on that compound. And it's interesting to think about why the only three inorganic thin films that people have taken seriously are SIGs, CADTEL, and amorphous silicon. And I've asked a lot of people this question, and I finally found the person who made this decision. It was Dan Arvizu um, working at, at NREL. And uh, when the budgets were slashed enormously around 1980, some very difficult decisions had to be made. And I think probably the right decision was made at that time uh, was to focus the limiting resources on just three technologies. But it would be a mistake for all of us um, to assume that those are the only three viable ones. Uh, and, and now as we go back and look, I think we will find uh, some uh, other materials that might be uh, good for solar cells. So now moving on uh, to uh, uh, SIGs. In many ways, it's a lot like cadmium telluride. It is more efficient. Uh, the, uh, the, the record efficiency is 20%. Uh, it can be uh, thermally evaporated, printed, sputtered, electro-deposited. There are a lot of companies working on it. Uh, I would say more companies are working on this in cadmium telluride. Uh, probably because the efficiency is a little bit higher. It doesn't have, um, it actually has a tiny bit of cadmium, but uh, not nearly as much cadmium as, as cadmium telluride. And certainly a few years ago, I got the sense that this would be the technology that would be the lead for thin film. And then First Solar just shot uh, past everyone. Uh, but these are, this is a partial list of the companies. And I just want to draw special attention to these three, Nanosolar, Mia Sole, and Solyndra they have all had at least a half a billion dollars investment. You know, these are just absolutely um, enormous um, investments. And uh, I think everyone is anticipating um, that uh, these technologies are really going to take off in the next year or two. That's probably going to be the excitement of um, 2010. So let me show you a couple of these technologies. Uh, this is uh, what nanosolar does. They have these um, inks and they are able to uh, print them. And if you made a solar cell with that, it wouldn't work at all. But the beauty of it is they're able to anneal it and convert that into high quality semiconductor material that is um, almost indistinguishable from what you would get from more conventional vacuum deposition um, uh, techniques. And so they are able uh, to uh, uh, print this uh, in roll to roll coders. I think uh, the width of this uh, is about uh, three feet. And uh, these rolls uh, shoot through the system at about 100 feet uh, per minute. Uh, so there's just enormous uh, throughput uh, with this um, uh, technology. Uh, and the, the, the primary uh, step here is not done in vacuum. So very uh, low cost uh, process. One of the other things that's innovative about this technology is there are, it's, it's done on aluminum foil. Uh, which is low cost and extremely conductive. And then there's uh, a second foil on the back. So there's um, uh, two foils that are the two electrodes, and both of them are on the back. And the way they get the current back there is when the current comes up to the top, it travels a short distance in a, a transparent electrode, and then it gets to one of these metal fingers, and it goes in the metal and then down through a via uh, to the bottom metal foil. So here's one foil, and then here's a second foil uh, uh, separated from the top one uh, by an insulating uh, layer. And so with that, they're able to use a very thin transparent uh, electrode, uh, which allows them to deposit it faster, and it also cuts down on absorptive losses uh, in that um, top layer. And I think this is a great example of how we're seeing whole new architectures uh, in how the uh, solar cells are being uh, made. Then this is one big uh, cell here. So they've used an unconventional module design for thin film. Normally, thin film, you wire the cells up in series on one substrate. They have decided uh, to cut the foils and use individual cells. They measure the efficiency of every one. They throw out uh, about 2% of them because they have the defects. Um, and then they um, only employ the, the good ones, and that has 
uh, boosted their yield and allowed them to make uh, really good modules. They have 11% modules, and um, for the small cells, they've been able to print 16%, which I find remarkable. The world record's at 20%, and they've been able to print a 16% efficient cell. Um, I'm pretty sure that this is six by six inches. Here's another uh, SIGS uh, technology uh, by Solyndra. What's cool about this one is um, it's, it's a whole new module uh, design. So they take cylinders of glass and uh, put them in a bath and electro deposit uh, the SIGS uh, on there. And then uh, a module uh, is a rack of these tubes. They're probably look a lot like the, um, you know, the fluorescent uh, light tubes. They're going to have a you know, different color, of course. Uh, and so they say that this is uh, much easier uh, to install. And what they do is they put it over a white roof, and if light misses the panel, uh, then it will uh, scatter off of the roof and come up and hit the back side of the, uh, uh, the module here. And the thing about this is, uh, it, it doesn't matter so much what angle the light comes from. So they put this uh, flat on the roof and don't worry about any um, angling. Another thing that's really nice about this, they put an outer uh, glass tube around it and they seal it with a metal cap. They have a very small area where they need to get a really good um, uh, seal. So they, they say that it's easier uh, to um, seal. Um, here they show um, what one of their systems uh, would look like lying flat on the roof, and another one that was tilted. Uh, you see, they made a, they really tried hard to do a fair comparison uh, <laughs> between uh, those two. There's just no way that you'd be able to put you know those soles over over here. Uh, but that's that's the difference that you you see. Uh, and I, I was talking to um, uh, someone at a, a CEO of a solar company, and he was saying. Um, that their customers uh, have different preferences, and this might be the preferred way to go when you're putting on a new roof. Uh, if you were gonna do a new roof and you needed to paint it, um, then, then maybe this would be uh, the, the way you would go. Another advantage that Solyndra likes to talk about is that wind can pass right through, um, which is why they don't need as uh, beefy of a support here. You can imagine how if wind comes and catches this one from behind, it could rip it off, and, uh, and, and so you have to have a very secure uh, mounting system uh, to, to hold that down. And they also get into heating. When, when you heat a solar cell, its efficiency goes down, so if you have really nice air cooling, you're gonna get a higher efficiency uh, than if you have a cell flat down um, on the roof. Uh, there are nice videos um, uh, where Solyndra on, on their website where they'll show you how they make these and, and how these um, install these. Not everyone um, agrees that this is the way to go. Uh, you're using a lot more material when you do this, and I bet a lot of you would enjoy reading this um, blog on the NanoSolar uh, website. Now let's talk about uh, amorphous uh, silicon. Those who... Um, believe in this will often tell you there's no scarce element. And if the tellurium and indium concerns really pan out, um, amorphous silicon may uh, emerge as the leader uh, in, a, in a few years. It's not as efficient. It, uh, world record, and, and you need a multi-junction to get this, is 13%. And it even degrades a little bit, um, although it, uh, it, it stabilizes after the 10 or 15% degradation um, occurs. Uh, here you, you see uh, uh, some of the flexible modules that can just be rolled out on a uh, rooftop. Uh, one of the bigger problems is that the deposition is very slow, about a tenth of a nanometer a second. So it takes about 50 minutes uh, to put down uh, the amount of amorphous silicon you need. If you do that in a roll-to-roll -roll coating uh, 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 machine, that means your tool is extremely long because you, you need to keep it in there. Uh, for, for 50 minutes, and um, that means that uh, the tool cost is high, and First Solar would tell you that um, uh, the, the capital investment is too high for this to scale as fast as uh, First Solar has been able uh, to scale. Um, applied materials, um, they don't use roll-to-roll -roll coating, they use a batch process. They're making gigantic modules. These things are 5.7 uh, square meters 
so these, these modules are um, quite a bit taller uh, than, than I am. And um, they feel that the large modules are the way to go. Uh, they bring a crane out, and here you can see the, the crane holding up this module and getting ready to um, uh, place it um, down. And uh, uh, because they have uh, much fewer modules, there are fewer connections to make, uh, there's less um, wiring, um, and they believe they can lower the balance of system uh, uh, costs here. Uh, and I'm not saying a whole lot about the installations, but there you just see nice, simple metal rails. You, you come out, you put some concrete in the ground, and then put this in, in place. And there's um, a lot of good videos out on the, on the website, so you can um, look on the Applied Materials website and, and see videos uh, of a, a typical installation. So now let me switch over uh, to the technology that I work on, uh, organic uh, semiconductors. Uh, here we're, we're using uh, molecules uh, that are um, based on abundant um, uh, resources. No, there's no scarcity there. Uh, this one is copper thalocyanine. It's used in blue car paint. Um, already 100,000 tons of it are manufactured um, every year. The cost of this that you'd need in solar cells would translate into about 17 uh, cents uh, per meter squared. Uh, but one of the, the really great things, you can you very easily deposit it in a roll-to-roll -roll, uh, coating machine. And here's an example of um, a flexible module uh, made by um, Canarca. So the, the physics of these cells is totally different. Um, and I, I don't have time to fully explain it, but there's no real PN junction. The semiconductors don't even need to be doped. You have what's called a bulk heterojunction, where there are two interpenetrating semiconductors. The um, uh, size scale across here is only about 10 nanometers. And when one of them absorbs light, it gives the electron to the other, and you have the electrons in one material and the holes in the other, and then they get carried out uh, to their uh, respective electrodes. The world record was 6.1% uh, in June. 6.77% uh, uh, was uh, finally published um, a week ago. It was announced three or four months ago. So the efficiencies have been coming up um, you know, fairly rapidly uh, in the uh, last couple of years. When you look at a quantum efficiency versus wavelength plot, it's only about 65%, um, and uh, that turns out to be because the cell is just too thin. Uh, the carriers get collected, but um, the cell is not thick enough to absorb the light. Uh, when they make it thicker, then they do have a problem collecting the charge. Um, I believe we can improve that, um, so I think we'll see um, about a 25 30% boost in the current uh, relatively soon. And then the other thing you look at, the band gap is way too high. There's no absorption um, down here in the infrared. Uh, so as the um, energy levels get optimized, I think we'll see much better cells. Uh, here, if you think about how to optimize it, you need to get the optimal band gap, and then you have to reduce the amount of energy you lose during the electron transfer uh, step. And uh, in, in this cell, um, I don't think I have it written down here, but I think they threw away eight-tenths of a volt um, in that um, electron uh, transfer step. Calculations have been done of what the efficiency would be as a function of this offset and the band gap. And if you optimize it um, in a single junction cell, uh, you should be able to go uh, um, to just about 11%. And if you properly design a tandem cell, uh, you ought to be able to go to 15%. Now, the biggest question people have about organic solar cells is reliability. Are these molecules going uh, to last for 30 years in uh, sunlight? And uh, for sure, they're going to need to be encapsulated. They're not going to make it um, in air. And I suspect there will need to be um, a UV uh, filter, which to some extent you get for free when you uh, package the thing in um, glass. And then if you do that, there are many molecules that are stable in light. This is data from a paper that just came out in the last couple of weeks. And they test cells under 2.2 suns at 48 degrees C. And they see 80% failure after uh, a little over 8,000 hours. So um, that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, after 33,000 hours. 
So if you multiply that by 2.2, you expect 73,000 hour or 8.4 year lifetime in continuous use, but the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day. And so when you account that you only have five hours of, of full sun per day, you should be getting 40 year uh, lifetime. And I don't want to imply that every molecule does that. Um, zinc thalocyanine is very similar to the copper thalocyanine used in car paint. It's a very stable um, family of organic semiconductors. And it may be a challenge to get the efficiency and the stability together, but I think this is a very encouraging uh, result that, that shows that we may be able to solve the stability problem. I've listed some papers here that you can look at on my website uh, that show all these advances that have happened in the last year. Now let me say a little bit about uh, multi-junction uh, solar cells. So they're complex, a lot of layers. They're deposited one monolayer at a time, very slowly, very high vacuum system. Um, Steve Eglash uh, gave a lecture in my class last week and, and he's been doing MBE for uh, a long time and pointed out this is probably the most complex electronic device that's ever been made. Uh, it's very sophisticated. Every one of those layers um, has an important role. And that's why it gets such a remarkable um, efficiency. Uh, right now you can buy 37%, so not quite as good as the world record, but still phenomenal for about $50,000 uh, a meter squared. So the price is very high. So obviously we're, we have to uh, concentrate the light uh, to be able to use those. And not that long ago, uh, you know, you, you tended to think of very large systems, but we're seeing a lot of innovation right now. I think there are about 20 startups um, working in, in, in concentrators, and, and one nearby is Soul Focus. And so what they have is a lot of relatively small concentrators. And that's better because uh, if this thing distorts in the wind, then some of the light might not hit it. It's a lot easier to make it stable um, when you have uh, smaller systems. And here, the heat is just enormous there. Um, so the cooling is difficult. It's a lot easier uh, to cool each one of these um, smaller uh, spots. One of the uh, things to realize with concentrators you, you, it only works in direct light um, because you're, you're, you're focusing it to a point. Um, it needs to be uh, coming from a, a, a certain direction. So this is not the way to go um, in a cloudy place like Seattle. Um, and you, you have to track the light. You, you have to have a very good system uh, for having this um, point right at the light. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you run some numbers on this, um, if your cells are at 50,000 per meter squared, but you uh, use 500x concentration, you can bring the area down and, and get $100 of solar cell per meter squared of light that you can uh, capture. But then you need another roughly $200 per meter squared for tracker and, and the concentrator. And even that, that's probably being a little bit optimistic. And you work through these and, and you get that, yeah, maybe you could get $1.50 uh, per watt. Um, and, and so personally, I think this trails a little bit behind the thin film uh, technologies, but there are people who believe that they can do even a little bit better than that. And what makes all of this so interesting is everybody comes in around $1 to $2 a watt. And when you consider how many things go into the calculation that could be off by 10%, you know, there's a factor of two error. And that means there, it's a very interesting race. Um, I, I wouldn't have wasted your time talking about a technology that has no chance. They, they all have a chance. Now let me say a little bit about some new technologies. Um, multiple exciton generation has generated a lot of excitement. And the key idea here is that uh, you, you have quantum dots, and if a high energy photon comes in, it excites the carrier uh, up into a higher lying level, the exciton, the bound electron hole pair, can split, and you can get multiple uh, uh, pairs. And that's great because, see, if a low energy photon comes in, you get one pair. If a high energy photon comes in, you get two. You didn't lose any energy. You didn't have that thermalization down to the bottom of the band. So potentially you can do a lot better. You could imagine having your quantum efficiency look like this. It's 100% between one band gap and two, and then it jumps up to 200% at two band gap, 
uh, and at 300% at three times the band gap. The only problem is this is what we have. Um, it just starts to happen at three times the band gap and doesn't really get efficient until four or five times the band gap. And this is way out in the ultraviolet and there is no real um, power out there uh, to be had. Um, so um, personally, I think the odds of this working someday are, are very low, well, well below um, 1%. Um, but there are people who are working on this and, um, and hoping that someday they can find a system uh, that behaves uh, like that one. And just one last new technology. Um, there's a, a lot of interest in nanowires. And uh, the cool thing about this is you kind of flip the PN junction up on its side. And so now light comes in this way and you can have plenty of thickness to absorb the light, but the carriers only need to travel a short distance to get to the junction. So potentially you could use very impure uh, material, but still harvest um, all of the uh, carriers. And that, that's the main driver why a lot of people want to do this. And um, uh, a postdoc that works with uh, Mark Brongerzma, Yi Chui, and I uh, got 6.4% uh, efficiency uh, as a postdoc at Berkeley uh, before he uh, came here. So now let me get to the most important part of the talk. Um, how can you get uh, involved? Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities. There are over 20 professors here uh, working on uh, solar cells. Uh, we have the Center for Advanced Molecular uh, Photovoltaics, and, and I talked uh, last year um, about that. There are 12 professors here at Stanford uh, working on organic or dye-sensitized solar cells. And uh, you can um, go to our website and, and, and find out who those professors are and, and, and what we're doing. Uh, another area I'd like to highlight is reliability. Uh, a lot of companies um, uh, have problems with that, with all the technologies. Uh, it's very demanding to put solar cells um, outside in the sun. They heat up every day, cool down every night. Um, and uh, uh, Reiner Dauskart is an expert on the mechanical properties, and, and he's looking into the possible failures at interfaces. And in my lab, we're starting to set up the facilities to test large numbers of cells over uh, long periods of time. Uh, we have efforts in inorganic uh, uh, thin film, uh, SIG, CZTS, amorphous silicon, polycrystalline silicon. As I said before, nanowires are um, extremely popular. A lot of, a lot of groups uh, are working with nanowires. We have work on multiple exciton generation, a completely new approach that it would probably take me five or 10 minutes to, to do that idea justice. Um, you should look on the GSEP website and uh, have, have a look um, at this uh, approach that Nick Malosh and Ziek Shen have invented. And, we have people working on solar thermal, which is not a solar cell, but it's a way to get power from the sun. Um, and we have people doing um, advanced optics, uh, ways of, of more effectively absorbing uh, the, the light. And we have courses here um, for undergrads and, and just um, a, a, an introduction to, to solar, but also fuel cells and batteries. Bruce Clemens has a course. Um, I have a course where I expand this lecture into a whole quarter. Uh, and, and, and go through all the equations and teach uh, the students how to use a device simulator uh, to model the devices. Uh, and then Peter Poyman is going to teach a very similar uh, course. Uh, mine's in the fall and his will be uh, in the uh, winter. Finally, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, a lot of people who have taught me uh, about solar cells um, over the years. Um, one thing that's special about solar cell researchers is that they tend to be incredibly nice uh, people and uh, not quite as intensely competitive and cutthroat um, as a lot of scientists I've seen in, in, in other communities. They're often um, very willing uh, to help each other. And uh, you know, we had a, a really phenomenal generation of uh, solar cell researchers um, here at Stanford. Uh, and, and they've gone out and, and really become the leaders in a lot of the in industry. And I, I think it was hard for them when the number of researchers at Stanford uh, uh, bottomed out at zero um, uh, around 2000, and, and they've been very happy uh, and supportive to see it uh, come back up. Uh, so you know, a couple of, of my former students who are, who are now at companies, they, they, they taught me a lot, and um, I really enjoyed working with the founders of, of NanoSolar 
uh, back when it was uh, just a four-person uh, company and uh, uh, talking to the venture capitalists at, at Moore Davida and looking at the business models and everything. And uh, Chris Eberspacher um, uh, helped develop that technology at NanoSolar, and he's now at, at Applied Materials. And uh, Dick Swanson always, you know, comes back almost every year and, and you know, gives a, a wonderful talk. And uh, Dave Eaglesham, uh, the, the head of technology at First Solar, uh, also seems to make it out to Stanford almost every year. And, um, uh, and, and, and the list goes on. Alan Farnbrook is here. He, he used to meet with us every week and, and uh, uh, teach us about inorganic solar cells and, and help us to get some, some of these ideas going. I went on sabbatical at, at NREL, and uh, this is a very nice team of um, people. And these are my students who've TA'd the course, who uh, helped generate a lot of these uh, slides. Uh, and Steve Eaglash is here, and he's helping us to start organize the solar community here. We, we, um, we're going to try to build a, an even bigger uh, solar cell center, and, and he'll probably um, help us uh, with that. Finally, I want to thank the source, uh, the, the biggest source of my funding. It uh, comes from an unusual place, the uh, uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in, in Saudi Arabia. They give us $5 million a year, and uh, we're helping them get their university going. Uh, this is what their university looked like in August of 2007, and this is what it looked like last month when they opened. It's just amazing. Uh, uh, they had over 10,000 people uh, uh, building uh, the campus. And so I'd like to just end by pointing out just how amazing uh, progress can be when that many people uh, get together and, and work on a common goal. <laughs> They're on the roof, and uh, uh, we will be having a reliability program with them on, on the roof. So we'll see if, um, if our cells can handle, uh, handle ambient temperatures of 130, which will be even higher on the, on the roof. So that's all. I'd be happy uh, to answer any questions. I hear a little bit um, about that, um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know too much about the use of pyrite. Okay. All right, how about uh, back there in the back of the room? So, Manisolar, Miasolar and Selenka are famously kind of black boxes, but what's your best guess as to what are their technical limitations and why has it been so hard for them to, to get this? Well, it's tempting to say that with SIGs you have four elements to deal with, but that's not really true because you put down the cadmium sulfide and that's two more, and these things interdiffuse, um, and then you get some um, oxygen in there, and um, sodium frequently comes up out of the glass and has been shown actually to be beneficial. So you have an eight element uh, system, and um, that's, that's, that's tough, tough to control, uh, tough to understand, and uh, I, th I think that is why um, it has been difficult uh, to uh, manufacture uh, that, that technology. Um, it's, uh, you know, I don't know, as a university professor who's never manufactured anything, it's hard for me to say um, how hard it will ultimately to be to control that. Um, uh, you know, nanosolar, though, I mean, they are doing util utility-scale um, installations right now, so... They, they are uh, running their factory. Uh, thank you. Uh, two or three years ago, I was looking into a solar uh, full photovoltaic uh, system for my home, and I learned that a very thin shadow line across the panel would like totally degrade the performance of the panel. Has anybody gotten around that? Yeah, so the, fundamentally what's going on there is uh, a lot of cells are wired up in series, and uh, the whole the current is is limited by the cell with the lowest current. So if you um, if you just cover one cell, you're going to kill the whole thing. There is a way to fix it. You just have to put in a bypass diode, uh, and when you have that diode in, in place, the current can get around um, a, a poorly performing uh, uh, cell. 
Um, BP Solar definitely uh, uses bypass diodes. Um, other companies um, don't. If I had to guess why they don't, um, is that a bypass diode does not improve the um, performance that you get to put you know, on the sticker. It, it affects the real world um, the performance, but not the, um, the tests, so to speak. Um, and so you're, you're, you're paying, but, but still, people need to learn how to market that. And um, I, I guess I'd be surprised if um, we didn't start to see more incorporation of bypass diodes. Um, are, there, are, are there any of these technologies that have serious problems with um, increasing efficiency over time? You said, are there other technologies? Or no, if the, any of the technologies that you talk about now, if there are any of them that have, that have serious problems with dropping or something? Okay, silicon is extremely stable and, and literally cells were put out 30 years ago and they're still working. Um, a lot of people are reporting good stability with SIGs and cadmium telluride, um, but others have, have don't always agree with that. And I just personally don't know what to do when I hear people disagreeing like that. I, I don't know who's telling the, the truth. Um, amorphous silicon is well known to degrade by about 10 to 15 percent. It's called the Stabler-Ronsky effect. Fortunately, it, it, it doesn't keep going. It, it stops um, at that point. And or, yeah, organics are, are, are new. Uh, a lot of the record cells live for about three years. Um, this newer result um, is a 5.5% efficient cell that lasts for the, for the 40 years, or at least under accelerated conditions, it's expected to, to last that long. And then the even newer technologies have not been uh, tested yet. Yeah, just on the, on the point you have with the concentrated high efficiency cells, uh, where we're going to affect the output population of about 50 a watt, uh, does that take into consideration the fact you're going to get more sun? Uh, meaning because you're going you're gonna to track it? Um, so the, the calculation was under peak conditions. And you're correct that if you track when you average over the day, um, you're, you're going to do a little bit better. Whatever, 30 or 50 percent more light. Yeah. On, on, on the other hand, yeah, on the other hand, multi-junction cells do very poorly early in the day and late in the day when the spectrum changes and the current matching gets messed up. So um, I, that's an interesting question, and I'm not sure. Um, when you stop looking at peak performance and look at performance averaged over the day, I'm not sure how the numbers change. All right, let me see. Who was next? Uh, I, I think you were next. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, would you say something about the difference in the incentives in Germany and the United States? Germany has an immense amount of solar cell activity in front of the sun. Right. Yeah, you know, that's, that's really not my area of, of expertise. I mean, obviously the incentives are, 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 are better there. Uh, of course, it, it, it's not where you'd want to put solar cells, but, um, but that's what's it's happening. My job is to make the cells better. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.